Hello and welcome back to this final set of four uh, for AP Physics C Electricity and Magnetism AP Daily Practice Sessions. My name is Eastman Landry and I teach at the Kinder High School for Performing and Visual Arts in Houston, Texas. In this video, we're going to be covering the lab-based question for this final electricity and magnetism exam. So if you want to try it out before we start hopping into it, remember there's a link on the screen and let's get on over to it. Here we have this experiment. That's how we know this is an experimental design question. We also see this little grid down here below. So you can get some key features as this problem kind of reading through. There's some paper, has a given area, same area. There's 500 sheets. We're having a parallel plate capacitor. So this is a lab-based FRQ about capacitors. Lab-based free response questions can be the ones that kind of bog students down in terms of taking up a lot of their time. So if you're just going through the test in order, great. But if you're trying to find the lab-based one, make sure you definitely set that timer for 15 minutes so that you have a chance to really access those other questions. With that let said, let's hop into this problem in particular. I want to see, I want to indicate which quantity should be graphed to get a straight line that slope could find a numerical value for the dielectric constant of the paper. Anytime you see questions like this, not that you're looking directly at the equation sheet, but oftentimes it's a small manipulation, if not directly from that equation. You're not doing a whole derivation to find this out. Remember, this is the first part of this question. So if I'm seeing capacitance, I should probably look at this equation for capacitance that sure enough has D and C in it. And then when I look at that, I'm thinking, wait, I need to find a slope. Y equals MX plus B. Well, this kappa epsilon naught A term is my M, which if C then has to be my Y for my vertical axis, and then my horizontal axis is one over D. Doing all of this is just worth one point by picking those axes. Could you flip it around? Sure, as long as it's something that would still give you a linear slope based on this equation, you'd be in good shape. So this is just one example of the way that I'm hopping through. One note here, it says use the remaining columns um, for any additional work you might do. So C is just C, but I'm gonna use one of these columns to also ch change D into one over D. So again, they gave you two columns, not to be tricky, but to say, hey, you might want to manipulate two things for fun. So that's why they gave you both. Don't feel like you have to use both if they're given to you, as it says, um, you may use them if you want to. So looking at this graph, kind of expanding it just a little bit, we have a vertical axis C, one over D. So I'm, this is gonna be my Y, this is gonna be my X, my X being one over D. It did say to use units as well. So there's my meters to negative one or one over meters. And I basically took each of these values in my calculator and typed them in. Notice, I didn't carry this out to a lot of decimal places because that's just gonna take additional time. And when you plot, you're not gonna be plotting to the exact decimal. So generally, if you plot to the general two significant figures, you're all good uh, when you collect your data. I'm also gonna do this on my actual paper. I'm gonna cross out D. I just did all this work to plot these two. I don't really wanna look at D ever again. I'm not gonna scribble it out. I still wanna be able to see underneath it, but I'm just gonna make this note. So, hey, here's the two values that I care about for this problem. Okay, back to it. I didn't get any points for doing that, but I do get points for this part. So here's my chart that I've made with my values plugged in. And it says this word, plot. I'm plotting the data points, clearly scaling and label axes, including units, and then draw a straight line that fits the data. So what's that look like? Ta-da! It would look like this. We scaled our axes where we had our biggest value, smallest value, and this in all would be worth four points. Four points, you might say? Yeah, here's what those four points are for. If you graph using more than half the grid, that's one point. If you scaled this that all the data points were like squished in this tiny little corner, you would not earn this first point because you squished it too small. So really expand your data set um, to make sure it fills up as much of the full grid as possible. Um, I think the rule is generally more than half of the plot area and more than half of each axis. That generally gives you all credit. The next one is for labeling axes with units. And you're like, well, what if I leave out units? You wouldn't get this point. It told you to do it. It said include units. So include the units. Plotting data, that's just putting the points there. And then ultimately drawing a trend line because that's what it asked us to do. So we did all the things. This is all worth four points. With that trend line, what are we going to do with it? We're going to use that straight line to calculate the dielectric constant for the paper. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, we don't want to use the data points. Like, wait, we just drew all those things. Why not the data points? Because now it says using the straight line. You want to use your trend line. So make your AP reader, could be me sitting there reading it, make me happy by clearly labeling your points. What does this mean? Put a circle on the line, pull your data off to the side, put a circle, pull your data side. If you do that, then I know that you're using data points from the line, not from the raw data itself from the chart. So always use data from the trend line, not from your data points. Okay, that said, I'm looking at slope. So I'm doing my rise over run for my values. I take the actual value of the slope and I recognize that the slope is equal to what I had on that first slide, that kappa epsilon naught A. We knew that 
a is given to us in the problem, 0 0.06. So if we make that substitution with our epsilon naught term, we get our answer three points. What are those three points for? For solving for slope generically, for actually relating slope to something within the equation, and then for probably actually solving the equation to get our final answer. Um, moving right along in our question, now it's going to kind of take a little reset. It's saying, hey, you determined this previous value, and we now have this calculation that we found what the capacitance was going to be, and we put that capacitor into here. The one thing that I should have highlighted that didn't is it's just one sheet of paper uh, that ends up hopping to this uh, setup. But here's the key thing. We have the circuit that's kind of going on. So we're using the same idea from solving for it experimentally, and now we're applying that thing that we solved for into a uh, problem. We want to calculate the current in the battery immediately after the switch is closed. Well, immediately after the switch is closed, a little fact to just know, when you have an uncharged capacitor, it acts like a wire when the switch is closed. So I'm going to actually draw that here, kind of like this. I'm kind of fading that one out. But on your paper, I would kind of draw a line there uh, if you have it, or maybe redraw the whole circuit if you think that's worth your time. Um, and then I'm going to recognize I need to solve for the current. To solve for the current, I need to basically solve for the circuit. These two are parallel to each other. So I'm going to have that value to get uh, 40 ohms for my parallel component. And then 40 is in series with my 80, giving it a total of 120. So that's what I have represented here, is that my 80 and my 120, or sorry, my 80 and my 40, giving me a total of 120, and the voltage of my circuit being 36 volts. So sure enough, when I plug that whole thing in, I'm going to get my 0.3 amps. My three points for this one are probably going to be for recognizing when the current's initially closed, having that be zero, for solving for my equivalent resistance, for maybe getting the answer and or solving with Ohm's law. All those would be those points that you're looking for on this problem. So now we're continuing with that same thing for part E. I want to determine the time constant. This equation isn't on your equation sheet, so it's worth memorizing it. If you don't know it already for a capacitor, tau is equal to RC, where this R is the equivalent resistance of the circuit, or technically, if it was not the full circuit that we have in this case, it's all the resistors that are in series with this capacitor. So because this whole circuit is essentially can be broken down into series, uh, resistors in series with the capacitor, this all works out to be this. The 120 ohms that I solved for previously, the 80 and the 80 that were parallel, and the 80 that was in series, 120 times my 18 nanofarads. Remembering that nano is 10 to the negative 9. This is on your AP equation sheet, so you can look that up. Plugging that all in, that would get me two points. One, probably for this recognition of this equation and substitution, um, and then one for the answer, for making sure I had proper units, most likely, on my answer, because they did have these nanos uh, in there, so you probably want to make sure you did that correctly. So now we're at this part where we have students A and B measuring the time it takes after the switch is closed for half the minimum value to get charged, but it's fine, they find that it takes longer than expected. Again, this is still kind of experimental vibe. It feels like it's an actual lab setting. That's kind of the vibe for these lab-based uh, types of FRQs. So student A assumes the capacitance that they measured was correct, like that had to have been right. So would you then conclude that the resistance would be larger or smaller? This is very common. This is known as error analysis. We're saying, hey, something's different. How would this affect the outcome? Well, whenever that happens, you should think about what changed and what's constant. So you're assuming this capacitance is correct. That's not allowed to change. So if you do said that the time constant was longer than expected, that means that my equivalent resistance must have been larger than measured. So checking this box is all great, but I need to make sure I also explain what would account for this. Here's one possible explanation. You could say, wait, the battery is not ideal. This is an actual real lab scenario. That battery is going to contribute some of its resistance, which would raise the equivalent resistance of the circuit. There's maybe other options you might put as well, like maybe the wires themselves are long, or maybe they're made of a higher resistance material like aluminum instead of copper. Whatever you might put there, if it's reasonable and it causes the shift to go the right way, you're fine. So don't think there's one right answer. Uh, oftentimes, there's the one that's the easiest answer. But if you're thinking of anything that you think is reasonable in a lab-based question, you are absolutely fine. Commit to it. Show how it would make this shift change, and you're going to get those points. This, sadly, is only one point um, for this one. Why? Because the next question is essentially the exact same thing, and they don't want to over-reward it. So here we have the resistance value being correct, and what capacitance value would that be larger or smaller if we assumed resistance was the same? Well, same thing like before. If my resistance is required to stay the same, if this increased, sure enough, my capacitance value must have been larger than it was actually measured. What could have caused this to happen? Well, when we look at capacitance, we have a couple terms here that we could mess with um, in terms of like the paper, dielectric, or that and the other. But one that we're choosing to pick with here is this distance d. We can say, hey, before we had 500 sheets of paper, but now we just have one. That one that we picked could have been a little bit smaller, and it being smaller would have raised the capacitance. So when you look at this analysis, if you had said, oh, 
the D could have been larger, raising capacitance, you wouldn't get this point because that's not true. Always make sure that you're picking an explanation that is shifting the results the way that it's supposed to shift. If you say that, and it's a reasonable thing that could happen in a laboratory, you're gonna get credit for this sort of experimental error analysis that can take place. So that brings us to the end of this lab-based FRQ. Classic kind of question. If you notice, this is 7.99 out of 15. Of the three FRQs that we've looked at, this is actually the highest performing one. Why? Because that plotting, if you do it quickly, that's four points that are pretty easy to get. Any other points you get are gonna help raise that score. Um, whenever you look at this one, make sure you categorize the problem, look out for question verbs such as plot. So that means scale label axes with units and then plot those points to show each of those steps. When you're finding the slope, don't pick the data points, always pick data points from your trend line. And when you see those error explanations, once again, kind of like the justifications we did before, think the assertion, what do you think the answer is? They oftentimes that's kind of a checkbox or you have to just state it clearly up, down, left, right, increase, decrease. Uh, what is the evidence uh, that you have? That's kind of a generic physics statement. So kind of, oh, capacitance is defined as this, that. But then the connection as we had in that last slide being that because the distance decreased between the plates, that would then cause the capacitance to increase. That is then this connection bit. So actually apply it to what's going on. With all that said, I've had a great time working with you for these last I guess now fourth video that you see here. You'll be there next week to work with Shelly for a couple more for AP Physics C Electricity and Magnetism. So I wish you all the best on your exams and maybe I'll see you around. Bye.